Well, hello, welcome back to the big board. It's Kev here. We're gonna try and have a relatively succinct conversation about <clears throat> EFS, the Barbarossa system, and in particular this module, Army Group South. And I was thinking about how I wanted to approach this and what I wanted to say. And um, it got a little more complicated and convoluted as I started thinking through the, the situation and my feelings about the game and all the rest of it. And I've got to, you know, give the system credit. Uh, I've only played the ten, 12 turns of this, I believe. And I think some of the things that I am not that excited about with this game may be functions of the module or maybe functions of some of the specific rules for the module, I'm not sure. But uh, in order for me to uh, provide a fair and honest assessment, I probably need to break out Army Group Center, Army Group North, and in particular look at the rail capacity, the supply capacity, and the supply uh, that's provided <coughs> in terms of MSUs on a per term basis for all three modules and look and see if that's the, the, the situation here that the situation that is represented here is similar across those three modules uh, as well. Um, so I'm not. So I want to make sure that when you listen to or what I have to say or hear what I have to say, that it's taken in the context of a fairly limited amount of play, and it's also play that's been conducted solo. I have endeavoured to ensure that I have adhered to the rules uh, as much as possible, and in fact. I have corrected play where I have made mistakes, where it's been possible. Now, uh, that said, I don't have three or 400 turns worth of experience with this system, and nor am I uh, looking to recreate the lockstep history of Division A in Hex B at time C uh, as per the historical time schedule for the Barbarossa conflict in its enormity. I'm playing this uh, on the physical components. I'm not uh, playing this on Vassal, which I think has a very different feel to it. And <clears throat> I think all of those things kind of mitigate your perceptions of how this game works, what it is, and, and what, it, uh, what it might be good for or not good for. So why have I stopped at uh, game turn 12 out of a scenario that has, by the looks of it, 24 turns? Well, um, I feel like I've got a handle on how the system works. I feel as though I have an understanding of how supply, the nexus between supply, supply points, the supply uh, rules, and the transportation network work, which is kind of the crux of the game. Uh, the combat system is pretty straightforward. And it's also it's also a monstrous at this point in time and uh, for the conceivable, conceivable future for the Soviets it's a beatdown and uh, it, it's while it's fun to jam the panzers across the open plains it's it's getting to be a little bit more of the same and uh, if I was playing this as an opposed play I think as the Soviet player. I'd be more than a little frustrated with uh, the situation, and as the as the German player, it, it's becoming a little bit tedious uh, looking for the you know the sneaky way around so, uh, defensive positions, and uh, you know you've got a pretty much an overwhelming force. Uh, the loss rate and the loss rate for the Germans has been fairly light. Uh, I have replaced some units, I used some replacement points, but uh, losses have been fairly light, probably 10 infantry points and maybe four or five or six, maybe four uh, armored points, I would say. Uh, they're floating around here somewhere with the losses. I don't know where they are. I, there's one there. Um, there's some others in these stacks as well. Anyway. The losses is not the point. The point here is that uh, I think I've, I've got out of this particular scenario what I was looking forward to experience out of the EFS system. <clears throat> so let's change gears a little bit. 
And let's talk about uh, the kind of the, the means that which we, you know, mean the way we uh, have done in writing with some of my other uh, gameplays. And we'll just go through the decision space, the roles, uh, player objectives and stuff like that. And, and let's kind of run through that and try not make this an hour long exercise. So you know, the decision space, as you can see, we're dealing with five or six kilometer hexes here and uh, it's two day turns. And we're looking to uh, understand and deal with the geo how we rapidly capture geographical locations, such that uh, against a, against a time a time limit, because some of these uh, victory point locations become worth much less after a certain point in time. So that's that's your primary objective here is the capture of physical locations. And the top right hand side of the screen is Kiev. And we're, uh, we're, we're advancing from left to right. So we started it all the way over there, the left hand side of the map, somewhere in eastern Poland, and uh, moved through Lvov and whatnot. And we're in the central plains, uh, north uh, of, uh, I think this is, uh, here's the Bug River here, <coughs> north of the Bug River. And uh, we're now into what I would, you know, essentially call the Ukraine area. So that's your decision space con construct. Your role, you're really uh, running what would be an army group here and making decisions down at the divisional level. So, you know, this, you know, this division of armor, uh, this division of armor, these divisions, you're directing traffic at that level. There are supporting units that might be battalions or smaller. There are regiments of different uh, types. So here's a, a uh, regiment, is that a regiment? Yes, a regiment of uh, engineers that will need to be used and deployed to clear strong points or whatever the case may be. And on the Soviet side, it's a similar situation where you do have some units that are unknown in, in uh, uh, strength points like this little guy here. They have no movement rate until they're flipped over and most of them are going to have a uh, zero, one or two combat strength or and uh, uh, two movement points on the right hand side. So that's your that's your role that you're filling. Um, and I mentioned the game scale is two days a turn. And uh, it, you pretty much have uh, unlimited intelligence to the extent that you can see everything that's on the board. Uh, you're not supposed to go digging through stacks necessarily. And there are some dummy counters that are used on the map, uh, particularly for the air war, where we will wish to, uh, we will wish to uh, place potentially place dummy units uh, to spoof uh, one side or the other as to who is actually uh, you know pushing air units forward. Uh, it's kind of an awkward construct to me. I I, I, I don't see the value in it, but the, it's there. Uh, the granularity of the OB of the order of battle is, uh, you know, it's accurate, I imagine. Uh, I'm not an expert in the Russian front. Uh, there are a lot of units. Everyone has a de designation. There's a specific historical setup location for every single unit. We're digging down to the uh, regiment scale, generally speaking, for nearly everything, I believe. Uh, there are some the occasional battalions of stuff, so obviously uh, battalions of panzers and whatnot. So... And there's various, you know, there's target units in here and all sorts of, you know, artillery stuff and specifics and things like that. So that's all great. So I think, you know, you would not be unhappy with the level of historical detail. You may quibble about one or the other, whether one, you know, one something was a battalion or a regiment, was it a full strength or three quarter strength? That's not why I play games. Uh, but it's all here if you want it and you can probably tweak it to your heart's content. Uh, I already mentioned uh, player objectives really in terms of the role and decision space that we're, we're dealing with here. So I think that's pretty straightforward. But the way you win is by killing more than the other guy and capturing locations or denying the capture of those locations to your opponent. Um, which brings us to the next point in terms of uh, denial of access to uh, uh, terrain. The combat system and combat resolution is a... Uh, pretty straightforward little exercise despite the fugly table that uh, we're, we're presented uh, to use. Uh, it's all 
keep in mind it's all printed in the late 80s early 90s i think it's 94 or 96 or something like that so not the highest of quality or resolution standards in fact uh, everything has a murkiness to it particularly the setup charts uh, if i can find one here i'll show you uh, there's a there's a mushiness is probably the word i would use to all of these images of the counters they they're not super clear and when you're looking at three or four of these at a time it would have been lovely for these to have been in color uh, obviously costs were different back back then than they are today but let's talk about crt a crt uses a standard uh, die roll d10 based uh, combat resolution we calculate odds and round down uh, we use a significant number of DRMs. In fact, there's an entire chart over here that has uh, all the different DRMs, everything from terrain and weather, all the way through to fortifications and combined arms and uh, divisional integrity bonuses and artillery support and super heavy artillery support and all sorts of smashing things like that, including air support and the ever dreaded and present ability to provide supply to the attacker not to the defender but to the attacker the resolution is very very simple uh, there are however some funny results and if you look at the four to one table you'll see there's some gaps in there where there's no result so on a 10 uh, the attacker so let me try and there's something i can use as a pointer of course if i here we go. Organize this beforehand. Uh, four to one, you can see here that there's no no effect yet. On a, and then on an eleven, there is a retreat for the attacker and no effect to the defender. Uh, on a nine, there's a one step loss for the attacker. And in fact, uh, at that asterisk, you can see down here there'll be an extra step needed to be lost, depending on if you attacked with or without supply. And the defender will have to retreat. Retreats at two hexes. Uh, similar here, uh, uh, retreat for the attacker, no effect for the defender. And, uh, you know, looking at those results, you would think four to one is not a particularly good result uh, table to be fighting on. That's probably pretty accurate. You really want your combats to be rolling in at five, six, and seven to one. And at the point that you're getting to seven to one, that's the time when you might want to say, well, you know, I think I might want to try an overrun. And overruns are a function of movement, and overruns are, overruns are, are resolved very differently. Uh, you come in at a minimum of, uh, I believe it is five to one, and then, uh, but at seven to one or greater, you're, put, you're picking up a minus one on the die roll, and then you look at these are the results here. So two or less, you're gonna knock out, knock out a step, uh, and force a retreat, you're typically gonna, uh, on a seven or better, a seven or less, you are going to force a retreat, a two-step, a two-step, a two-hex retreat. And uh, I think the uh, the attacker drives that uh, result as well, uh, that uh, retreat. Uh, but eight or more, and then uh, you know bad things happen to the attacker. So you're always going to be wanting to pretty much roll in at uh, six to one or better and then uh, be doing that with German units and be doing that with uh, as many of these bonuses as uh, physically possible. The air war is very simply resolved. Uh, you're looking at uh, the, uh, you can go through your initiative uh, uh, assessment for each combat and then uh, you're taking the differential of the combat values of the air units and then roll the dice on a table and D10 as well. Um, over ha uh, half over half the time on a plus one. So if you have a, a one up on the person you're attacking, you're going to have no effect. Uh, two chances in 10 of an abort, two chances in 10 of a disruption, and one chance in 10 of making a kill. So it's very hard to kill off the air. It's also very hard to knock the air out uh, with AA. As you can see there, you've got to roll uh, particularly uh, high. And then funnily enough, everything else in the game, uh, uh, you roll to roll, uh, everything else in the game, you need to roll low to uh, secure kills 
but AA, you have to roll high to secure kills, minor annoyance. Uh, interdiction is very powerful because, uh, not only just because it can affect movement rates, but really the benefit of the interdiction capability is to interdict the Soviet headquarters, uh, these guys here. So this unit here, if I can get a one or two on that uh, headquarters unit, uh, one of these two interdiction level things, then that is going to prevent the Soviets from using many of their capabilities. They're no, making a no retreat stand, uh, 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 having reaction movement and things of that nature, which is the kind of the essence of the Soviet defense from what I can tell. So gets uh, the combat, combat and conflict resolution is pretty straightforward and very, very quick to do. So you can run through eight or 10 attacks in 15, 20 minutes and get it, get it all knocked out. The turns go relatively quickly once you come to grips with this uh, all-encompassing, uh, this is a fan-made uh, sequence of play. This covers every module. So there are a lot of extra rules in here that we don't need to worry about. But this is a four page sequence of play that just keeps you honest, keeps you on track. Uh, I'll touch on sequence of play for just a brief moment. <clears throat> I'm knocking pieces out of the floor. Uh, in that, uh, the, it's asynchronous, so, or asymmetrical. Is that the word? Asymmetrical, asynchronous? Uh, we do weather, I think we've discussed this before, we do weather determination, we do supply determination for everybody, we do replacement for everybody, we do uh, reinforcement withdrawal, excuse me, for everybody, we do air readiness for everybody. And then we do the Axis air interdiction phase. Uh, there's no naval in this, but then we do the Axis movement phase, the Axis declaration of attack phase, Soviet reaction, where any motorized units can move up to half their movement points, uh, we can designate artillery support for defender hexes. We can issue retreat and no retreat orders, <clears throat> uh, all that sort of fun stuff. But you can only do that with a headquarters that's available and within a certain number of hexes, and uh, or a motorized unit has to be within a certain number of hexes of the combat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, go through combat phase. We go through the axis motorized movement phase, which is kind of a secondary exploit phase where you're allowed to move motorized units an additional half of their movement points. Pretty typical stuff. There's an engineering phase where we're flipping bits and pieces over, where uh, you know putting ferry markers and a railroad conversion is done, and all that sort of fun stuff. All stock standard uh, operational scale gaming bits. Soviet play segment opens with Soviet motorized movement. Soviet motorized movement only, plus cavalry. <clears throat> Specialized movement is allowed, so reinforcement movement for those motorized and cab units. Uh, Soviet attack declaration phase, Axis reaction, three hex range, just like with the uh, just like with the uh, Soviets reaction phase. Soviet combat phase, then the Soviet movement phase, which is when the first time in the turn that you can move infantry units. So think about that. If you're trying to mount an attack. You're trying to mount a counterattack. You're trying to mount a defensive attack. You're trying to mount a spoiling attack. Those attacks have to basically be conducted by armor because armor is the only guy that can get to where the enemy is in the game turn to impact the, uh, the uh, result. So as the Germans, if, I, if I'm one hex away from you, uh, your infantry, your strong infantry units, which might be, you know, five factor or four factor combat values versus most of the armor is uh, two, three and four factor units. Uh, there are some fives, but uh, not very many. Uh, if I'm one hex away from you, all the Soviets can do is advance their armor up to attack. Meaning that the infantry is relegated to 100% being in a defensive mode the entire time, unless the Germans are silly enough to leave units adjacent to infantry, inf Soviet infantry units, and be exposed to the, uh, the the potential for an attack. So, 
two typical, here's two typical, uh, here's an infantry unit and a combat unit, uh, a tank unit. Now you can see clearly there's a very, very big difference in defensive values, five versus two, makes perfect sense. But, um, you know, not having infantry support means I'm not gonna be able to get any combined arms capability. Uh, unless I'm using cavalry, I'm not even sure they count. I never actually got to do very many counterattacks as the Soviets. So that, that's very, very different. And then there, obviously as we go through this uh, sequence of play, we do the Soviet engineering phase and we do the end of turn crap that needs to happen. So that's a turn sequence and uh, that, that sequence of play really forces very much the 1941, early 42, uh, mode of operations of the Soviets, where the armor was really the primary uh, probing attacking force and it was armor only, it was not combined arms. All very historical, all very good. Makes for somewhat of a challenging game for the Soviet player. What I found was, that was beneficial for the Soviet player was pretty much just when it was the Soviet uh, turn to move, you're, pe you're peeling back armor where you could obviously throwing uh, armored units in to block breakthroughs or uh, unexpected uh, d changes in direction by the, by the Germans. And these guys, this infantry, these infantry units, I would literally you know, put one here, then put one here, then put one here and just clog up that road so that these guys had to bring a lot of force to bear and try and knock out, you know, overrun and attack one, two, three, or four hexes before they got to this city or junction where uh, they would uh, then have to all kind of gather around for an assault. And by that time, you know, you've frittered away a lot of this uh, infantry, whether it's good stuff or bad stuff, and you're, you're defending with a somewhat reduced amount of units, not enough to mount an attack while these guys are all sitting adjacent to you. And in fact, most of the time, the Germans are gonna sit back a hex and go, okay, We'll maneuver to combat you. We'll move our infantry and our armor and our artillery up when we're ready to fight and then knock the, the stuffing out of you and go for it from there. Which brings us to logistics. And, and here's where I have the biggest issue with the game, the way the game is today. Uh, it's planned on being changed in the next version. They're changing the uh, categories of Supply units. Let me see if I can find a couple of supply units here. So we'll use the Soviet, the Germans because they're the ones that have the biggest issue. Uh, here's, a, here's a truck with one MSU. And here's a dump with two MSUs. And in the very early part of the game, I receive 10 MSUs a turn. So I can bring on, and I have a limited number of these. And basically, I think there's eight factors of this stuff available. It's either eight or 10, and I should know that, but I forget now. I've actually had additional factors being allocated as the game progresses, but the early part of the game, you have two things that are, are causing you woe. Uh, firstly, you, don't, you only have six rail capacity to move supply. So if I wanna move these two rail, these two uh, uh, MSU by rail, I can move them the full extent of the rail uh, head up to the rail head, let them stop, and that would be a, two, a dump somewhere, relatively inconvenient, but as close to the front as I can get. And then uh, let's say uh, I, I bring in uh, one MSU. Well, that means that there's one MSU that's not gonna make it on the board. He just goes away and we never see him again. We, we, we lose that supply from this opening onslaught in the first six turns or seven turns. I think you get 10 SP a turn. And uh, the same goes for this. And when I move this supply dump, uh, I, I put it on the railroad and it, it ends up the railhead. And let's just say that it happens to be within range, I think seven hexes in dry terrain. It's, uh, it's uh, seven hexes away and I, and I go, ooh, I'm gonna do an attack. I'm gonna provide attack supply because that it gives me, that removes the plus two penalty to the die roll. So that's a good thing, right? Well, I'm gonna use our supply point and you would think, well, you flip it over and then you'll have one left. No, sir, you have to use two. It just, it magically goes, it, it just disappears. 
That combined with the fact that I, I only have the capacity to move six on this set of maps and you know four or six down here, what you end up doing is taking the supply, the excess supply on this set of maps and, and using it by rail, moving it by rail to the southern set of maps and using up all of their, uh, their supply chits and filling up the supply dumps uh, on the map at the extent of the railhead so that they, that down in the south, they have a full, full stack of supply. And all of this stuff up here, you're left scrambling, taking uh, supply dumps and going, well, shit, I had two here, but I'm gonna flip it to a one because I really need to drive the line, the supply line forward. Uh, uh, because I've got to get the, the supply up to where I can fight. My railhead is all the way back. Here it is here. So that's the furthest I can get my rail, my, my uh, supply in. All the other supply that I was able to bring in earlier on, further back, you know, I've got a whole bunch back here. Oh, you can't even see that. I've got a whole bunch of supply back here. I can't use it. I can't rail it up. Because if, I, if I, I use the rail, the six capacity of rail to get it up to here, the supply that's off the map, it gets, it, it's gone. I can't bring it on. So uh, I've got to flip these guys over to, to ones and basically lose half of it and truck it up. And I, I just, I don't understand why it's, it is that way. Maybe it makes sense. Maybe historically that's, you know, there was so much supply that... Uh, we could afford just to blow through it all, but uh, coming from other game systems where supply is critical and important and you're always scrambling around looking for it and you tend to manage it well, this is a, unless there's some magic to how you do this, this is a very inefficient way of bringing supply to bear uh, with, a, with a focused attack. Now keep in mind, I, I drove, you, you drive where the resistance is least and sometimes that resistance is not going to be where you expect it to be. So early on, I got myself into a pickle because resistance was right in the middle, was weakest right in the middle here. There wasn't a lot of rail support. So I, I, I had to uh, go where the road was clearest and I was taking the least losses. And I came at Laval from, well, Laval's back over there, but uh, I came at Laval from the north and the east, uh, sorry, and the west and uh, surrounded it but it took a lot of doing because I, I I went around things as opposed to plowing through so it's almost like you need to pick a road run down it move this railhead maximum of four hexes every turn because that's as many contiguous hexes as you can convert and just live with it uh, you get additional railheads that can rail conversion in Poland and uh, other bits and pieces. There are a, a maximum number of hexes you convert a turn, but it's four on any given rail line. Uh, so, you know, you do the math. Uh, there's a max of four, which means I'm gonna be well behind, well behind my front line. Look, there's my front line, all right? So e even when I rail, when I rail stuff all the way up to here, I've then got to lose one for every one I convert and then start driving. Uh, and you know, it's eight movement points. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I can rail in, move, move some guys up and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, they're still not going to be within range, which is okay. You've got to do a bit of planning and you, you get your dumps where you need them and you start pushing trucks up a turn or two ahead and have a few milling around here. But at the end of the day, as the, as the access player, who gives a shit? I, I, I can, if I can pile in on seven to one or eight to one, I might just skip a tax supply. I'll just go without it. I'll take the two penalty because I can, uh, I, I can pick it up in uh, using engineers or using something else. I can, I can get, I can use air. I can get, uh, I can mitigate that two plus two penalty for the lack of supply, and uh, just go ahead and do a raw seven to one attack, and I'm probably going to be pretty good. I don't really care. And hey, you know what? If I'm at, if I'm out of supply as the German or Axis player, that's cool too, because there's no real downside to being out of supply as the Germans. You can't die. You can't die. You may not be able to attack very well. 
You may not be able to move as fast as you want to, uh, but there is no penalty to you on defense. Uh, well, there may be a die roll modifier, but you know it's 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 mouse nuts. And so uh, that compared to the Soviets, which every turn they're out of supply. Once they go from emergency emergency supply to out of supply, they're rolling on a table, and it's a you know, it's, it's not a it's not a it's not a it's not a guarantee they're going to die. But let's see, where is it? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, on a, on a one or a two, they're going to surrender, and they're, then they're not rebuilt. But there are modifiers to that, so it's really a one through four because they bear they bear an out of supply marker. Uh, if you're isolated, that's one through four, and you will surrender. So a forty percent chance every turn that you'll surrender. So it's great for the Germans. All these you know, little units here, they can surround these guys, stay two or three hexes away, build a big pocket. Uh, you know, because you don't want to have uh, you don't want to sit adjacent to the enemy because they could attack then. Um, but you stay one or two hexes away, build a big pocket, and uh, make the Soviets roll for supply uh, for these surrenders. That's that's how you just roll on by with ten or thirteen Panzer divisions and you just keep pounding away. I targeted headquarters first, priority one, priority two to a certain extent, artillery. Usually, that artillery was stacked or with the headquarter units. And then I, I, I prioritized attacking armor. I, every army unit I could kill, even if it was out of the way, even if it was shitty odds, I would go for it and attack it and try and kill it and get it off the map. And uh, that's why if, you look, if you're looking at those pieces there, you will see there's disproportionately a large amount of infantry on the map and not very much armor. And there are very few armor replacement points for the Soviets in this early part of the game. So what am I saying there? Don't know. Uh, <laughs> just saying that the supply system for me, it, 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 it just seemed enormously wasteful. And really at the end of the day, there's not a lot of risk for the Germans just to go, screw it, I'm all in. Just going for it. I'm rolling hot. I'm gonna take my chances. I'm gonna go out of supply. I'm gonna just bugger the, the, uh, uh, the supply train. I'll let it catch up to me when it catches up and just keep going until I start taking unacceptable losses with my arm. That's an entirely possible and probable and probably very historical for all I know. Super soda, hang on. Oh, I love Pepsi uh, Zero. It used to be called Pepsi Max in Australia. Okay, uh, historical narrative probably feels good, probably is relatively accurate. There are a lot of people playing this game for a long, long time, so I assume it's very, very accurate. It, uh, the game sequence, play sequence, tends to script the capabilities of the Soviets a bit, so I would say it has a modest amount of scripting here. Uh, you are not going off the rails too terribly much, but I think this is a game, it's, it's compulsive. I, I'm gonna tell you, I, I was done with this game at turn five, uh, but I wanted to see just what else could I do? How far could I get? What could I achieve? There is that, because it's easy to play, there is that compelling narrative of trying to roll, you know, move through the next turn. Yeah, let's just do one more turn. Let's do one more turn. Next thing you know, you're on turn 12. So uh, I, think, uh, I, th I think it's a compelling game to play. It's certainly not a game that I would set all uh, three or four or five modules up and do this. It, it, I think it would just become a bit of a drag after a while because you're actually probably going to have the capacity to move with everything and fight with everything. Whereas with some of the other operational scale games, you're not doing that. You may have 4,000 cameras on the map, but you're only moving to 300. The other guys are doing something. There's a kind of low level and low intensity fighting going on, but you, and you may be moving some of them, but you're not fighting with every single piece on the board. Here, it's absolutely conceivable that every single unit, if you could get it adjacent to something, you could fight with it. And uh, and go for it if you really wanted to. Um, so there's a, there's a there's this kind of uh, funky funky nexus going on there. Um, certainly identified with the narrative uh, the, and the story as it as it evolved for me. Um, I think there's quite a bit of replay here, just to, for, particularly for the Soviets. I think with the deepest skill and knowledge of the system, I think you could uh, put up a better defense than I certainly have this time. Uh, I, I certainly tried hard to, uh, to thwart the German uh, advance. Um, 
probably to the detriment of the Germans. I, I, I actually made uh, several uh, movement mistakes with the Germans that, that sort of penalized their movement. So uh, there was that. Playtime play is actually relatively quick. I'm going to call this... If you're an astute player and a snappy one, I think you could crank a turn an hour. Uh, certainly doesn't take me much more than 40 minutes to move uh, all the units on, on this section of the map and maybe uh, maybe another 15 to 20 minutes for the Germans down in the south. There's not a lot for the Germans, uh, for the Soviets to do down in this section. They're, they're kind of hunkered, hunkered in here. Um, they're, uh, you know, trying to hold the line right here right now. So we're trying to push some uh, reinforcements in to prevent this breakthrough. Here's an example of taking a, uh, the path of least resistance where we've got a rail line and a, and a very weak minor road and we're trying to press in here whoops sorry press in here and uh we're across the Dem denster river uh ahead of the ahead of the time series because uh, none of the romanians could cross yet so uh there's lots of interest there's lots of stuff to be done i i could see myself playing this again and in fact i'm on the 2nd of August, I believe I'll be playing with a, a buddy online, try and get some online exposure and some online uh, opposed play so that I can uh, uh, you know, tune and adapt my feelings and thoughts about the game with, uh, with somebody who has a, a modest amount of experience with the game based on what I've been reading online. And in fact, that person uh, uh, has a Twitter account and posts quite a few pictures and stuff and that they've been helping me out with some of the rules interpretations. So uh, certainly uh, good stuff there that we'll, we'll uh, share with you as, uh, as that evolves. Uh, playtime components. Components are gorgeous, right? The, the units are good. The, the, the setup hexes are hard to read on the, on the actual counters, uh, but the maps are gorgeous. The fonts are just fine for uh, for the attack defense move, they're all color coded, so there's a richness of uh, layered detail on the counters, which is nice. I like that. Charts are relatively well organized. There's setup charts for every single scenario, so that's good. Just you know, kind of poor print quality as a low definition, as I've already mentioned. And uh, the rules, the rules are not easy to digest, and that's a problem. The rules are exception laden. Uh, lots of uh, repeated commentary. Some bits are kind of scattered about the place uh, to a, a minor degree. Nothing horrible, but because of the way the sequence of play is laid out, you're, as the rules are laid out in sequence of play order, basically, you tend to be dealing with complex issues prior to learning how to move, fight, and uh, move and fight. So talking about supply and stacking and zones of control and all this sort of stuff, uh, determine the supply state and, and reinforcements and replacements before you know how to move or fight. Just made this set of rules complicated for me. And uh, if I had a, had a look at it and looked at the supply, uh, the uh, sequence of play would have gone to move and combat first, then looked at the supply rules, then looked at overruns, then looked at other bits and pieces and replacements. I'm not a huge fan of the replacement system either. Yeah, lots of lots of manual work with that, with uh, putting units into an eliminator box, then spending a replacement point and moving them into into the cadre box, and then putting them up into the you know ready to deploy box uh, with another point being spent. It um, it's laborious and painful. Just you know, if if it takes X number of turns to get a unit back to one step strength, let's just do that. Let's just put it on the track. We can and just say hey. Grab, uh, you rolled a, a five, grab five units, whack them on the turn track and bring them in two turns later versus uh, going through this machination of uh, do I want to build a whole bunch of units and have them in the cadre box or maybe in the next box up or in the ready to go box, or whatever the case may be. It is a pain in the ass. Uh, and there's, you know, rolls for extra strong points and um, yeah, you can see it all here. So I can get infantry replacement points. I can get... Uh, uh, armor uh, replacement points, and uh, but at some cost, there'll be you know mandated uh, attacks you know, will be uh, incurred at this level here. When I roll rolling low is good here, right? So yeah, okay, that's great. Uh, layers of detail, right? So anyway, all in all, funnily enough, 
despite my complaining about it and despite the, the, uh, some of the challenges of the rules and the exception laden nature of them, this, I think this single four sheet piece of paper and I've got a chart over a color chart over there on that rack, uh, that stack right there. It has all the movement points and the DRMs laid out with color coded uh, terrain. So I can actually see the terrain because the terrain chart here is in black and white. Uh, those save me from packing this up and not playing. Uh, this helped me streamline my reading of the rules. That helped uh, streamline the gameplay. These charts that are available in the game, uh, the combat resolution and all the other charts that are here, these are all fabulous and you can you know, play 75 or 80% of the game off the charts. I enjoyed it. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to buy the next release of it, but I enjoyed this system and I'll probably look forward to playing some stuff on Vassal. Uh, I may let these go at some point. I'm not necessarily certain I'm going to punch all of them and play all of them. I think I've got a good taste for how the system works. So uh, not saying that it's uh, bad or awesome. I'm saying that it's an interesting system and it's, uh, it's worthy of more play, certainly. And I'm sure there are lots of folks that would uh, disagree with the, my many of my characterizations of the game system and the game play. Uh, but uh, I, 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 for what it is, I enjoyed it. And the early part of uh, you know, 1941, uh, the, the combat that went down and the, uh, the grand nature, the grand scale of uh, maneuver warfare is certainly represented nicely. I just don't know that uh, I, I can uh, reconcile myself with the, the, the uh, number of supply tokens, the amount of supply given, and the rail capacity that is available to you as the German player. It, uh, it rankles me uh, somewhat, and I'm, and I'm hopping on that, and I've got it, I'm gnawing on it. I'm trying to reconcile myself with it. Sometimes when I do these things and I talk about them, I'll... I'll, I'll the back of my mind, I'll go, oh, no, that's why that makes sense, actually, now that I discuss it. And I keep trying to discuss it and think about it and reconcile myself, and I'm still not there. Good fun stuff. Go get a copy if you can find it, or wait till it uh, comes out and goof around with it yourself. Play it online with a buddy. Uh, get a scan of the rules and give it a shot. You might learn something. Have some fun. Uh, Look for, I'm looking forward to reading the new, improved version 2 rules to see what the differences are. All the very best. Talk to you soon.